Hi. Now, previously, I've explained the argument for why Asian shame culture is a it's a collection of personality disorders. At least that's what it looks like. So I could talk more about that later if you have questions you can ask me, but it it really looks like there's a, there's a lot of, it, you know, doesn't change, doesn't adapt. That's personality disorder. It's disturbing. It, it, it impairs social functioning. It makes it really hard to relate with people. And that's all personality disorder stuff. You've got you know, paranoia where we project so someone has his thoughts and worries and thinks that that's someone else's motive who's always out to get him. That's paranoid disorder from cluster A. Then you've got borderline disorder from cluster B. That's many, many, many short-lived, intense relationships, like super intense, love, hate, one or the other, both. Super intense, very short-lived. That can't, has trouble lasting. That's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a very oversimplified explanation of borderline. And then you've got uh, the, it um, uh, wouldn't be narcissism, it wouldn't be histrionic, it would be antisocial. The antisocial also from cluster B, where, uh, you know, people just lie that like they don't get action consequence, they don't get that. And uh, a lot of that has to do with you know, people literally not knowing on Friday what they're going to do on Saturday. And people lie by their first choice. They just lie all the time. And that comes from a lawless culture, a, th a third world legal system, which I've also established, especially with the traffic video, where the law is going to change and you just lie to the police in order to live because everything's illegal. It's, it might be legal today, but by this afternoon it might be illegal. And then by tomorrow, it might be legal again. So just everybody just lies to the police all the time anyway. That developed over years and years under Chiang Kai-shek and his son after. And it just sort of stuck around. It's slowly going out. It's slowly going away, but it takes time. Antisocial happens a lot in China also in overbearing, overcontrolling government. Any police state, any time the police have this elevated level over the people, I'm all for respecting police officers, but when they become a higher class, they're respected so much it becomes a higher class, whether in law or in culture, you're asking for an antisocial culture. They have to lie to survive. And so you have these two from cluster B, personality disorders have clusters. Cluster A is the um, kind of the, the bizarre, you know, the bizarre, strange, odd, and there you've got paranoid disorder. You see there's a lot of paranoia in the culture. Everyone thinks someone's out to, to get them. And that my motives for hurting someone would be, well, what other people's motives must be. That's why they did that. It's because if I did that, I would want to... So there's a lot of projection and paranoia. And then cluster B, you've got antisocial, as I just described, and you've got borderline. And from cluster C, You've got obsessive compulsive and then dependent and avoidant. And I believe all three of those are there. Obsessive compulsive is about micromanaging as a means of control, 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 control. And then you've got avoidant where people just avoid everything. They, they can't confront any situation, even if it's not a problem, it's just a situation. They can't confront it straight on just even to save their lives. Because you just avoid, avoid. And you got dependent where, where they need someone to take care of them. And it's unhealthy and it's weird and it makes it hard for them to get a job or find a spouse or not keep living at home with mom and dad or whatever at the workplace. So, I, you know, uh, so there, there's this type of stuff shows up all throughout the shame culture. And, and, and you can Google it and look up shame culture and, and look at what expats who've lived in Asia have said. Nothing I'm saying is original, except I do believe that I'm the first person to, to, to argue that, you know, as a lay person, that this really could be a mental illness. And then what you've got is you've got the mentally ill, crazy person in the family who then just beats and abuses 
the other people who get what's best unofficially informally known as abused wife syndrome where they just kind of surrender to it but it's not just abused it doesn't it's not just wives at all that's that that's the pop culture ignorant thing what it's known as it anybody does that when someone's around someone that's just loud and obnoxious and unrestrained everyone else just kind of surrenders to its existence and uh, you know whether it's a, a child or a, a, a parent you have, you have you have passive parents and a child has a strong personality parents don't know what to do so they just kind of surrender to it. And, and it's, it's really, it's not the child's fault, it's the parent's fault. They're supposed to lead. You know, they're the adults. Uh, they're, they're supposed to provide leadership, seek help if they need it. Know that knowing that you need help is, is the first step to the problem. So most of society surrenders to this and then they come along and they defend the crazy abusive people's right as a good thing for them to continue doing this. That's what, that's the abused wife syndrome. And that's happening throughout the culture. And it's like, that's shame culture. And that's personality disorder. And that's family that surrendered to the problem disorder or whatever it's called, not a disorder. It's very dysfunctional. And ultimately that's leading China to do what China's doing. And uh, of course, there we're dealing with what could be a grandiosity complex. I don't know. I, I love to psychoanalyst psychoanalyze, but Xi Jinping needs to be psychoanalyzed by a mental health professional. You cannot understand Xi Jinping by trying to look at the worldview of saying, oh, that's just his culture. It's just his leadership style. You've got to understand him. You've got you've to put him on the couch and psychoanalyze him as if he's a mental patient. And then Xi Jinping will make perfect sense. And why the culture is going along with it will make perfect sense. If you psychoanalyze what's happening in Asia, even, even, even odd culture differences from Japan, maybe, you know, Korea, what's going on, what, what Trump did with Kim Jong-un, and now what Kim Jong-un is doing with, with, uh, with Xi Jinping, uh, President Xi in China. If you look at what's going on, stop villainizing. Don't villainize China. China's not the villain. <laughs> they're mentally ill. There's a difference. And saying someone has a mental illness is not hatred. It's, it's honesty, an attempt to get help. You know, they call it an intervention meeting, uh, you know, in, the, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Someone's got a problem. The family members go to the person and say, look, we love you. You have a problem. Get help. So ultimately, you know, the solution is an intervention meeting, you know, and, and you know, whatever else. But so I've, I've explained that in greater detail and I've talked about that previously. And I want to give an introduction to what's, what this does to the education system in Asia. Because without understanding the education system in Asia, we can't understand Asia. There was a, uh, a friend that I made, an acquaintance, I met him once and we hit it off pretty well. Uh, it was a Chinese New Year's party at a, at a friend's place. Excuse me, pardon my French. And he had, I mean, that, he originally gave me the idea. I'd been in Taiwan five, six, seven years. And he, he had been here only two. And he had declared himself an American Taiwanese because he said, I, I was American and now I'm kind of in Taiwan culture and I love Taiwan and I consider this home. Well, easy come, easy go. It, I, I wouldn't declare that for so long. Um, it took me into my eighth or ninth year before I really actually decided uh, that I'd consider myself a type of American Taiwanese. Very, very American still. Um, but he apparently later on, I, I went to connect with him and found out that he'd left the country. He'd gone back to America because, as he told me, he'd gone to university and the professors wouldn't teach. And I'm like, oh, I know what you're talking about. I remember sitting with a parent in Taiwan, a wealthy parent, and uh, one of the children was having trouble understanding computer code. So this parent asked me, said, Jesse, do you know computer code? I said, well, I, I, can under, I could see if I can learn some things to figure out, see if I can help or not. I said, why, why, don't, why don't you just ask the teacher in the school to answer your questions? And the parent said, Jesse, don't you know how things are done here? You, you, school doesn't teach. You, you just go there and listen. 
And then after school, you go hire a tutor or you go to a cram school, and that's where you actually learn. But then you go to school, you pay all the tuition money, you take the test, you get the degree. That's, that's how it's done, don't you know? That's how we do it, don't you know? What's wrong with you, Jesse? Why don't you know that we're supposed to waste all our money on the tuition money to get the... Well, I'm, okay, now I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's, it was this condescending, I mean, very, very polite, friendly condescending. It was like, that's how it's done here. It was, com again, abused wife syndrome, a complete surrender to the culture, no desire to make a change at all or belief that it even should. So, uh, from this everywhere, there's a culture of cram schools. There's an entire market. It, people go to school. High, so high school gets out at 5 o'clock. You hear about Asians going to school until 10 p.m. School gets out at 5 o'clock. Usually starts maybe 7, 7.30 in the morning. Like class begin, like bell rings at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. Very normal. And if it begins at 7, it ends at 5, maybe 5.30. Uh, if you're weird, maybe 4.30. Uh, for for uh, high school. I think junior high school might get out a little bit earlier, maybe 4.00. And elementary school, maybe two or three. But then what happens is after that, they go to cram school. A lot of, a lot of students ride a bus for an hour, maybe longer, because the test is just everything. And you got to have the test. And that goes back to the old Asian emperor culture where, where the emperor went against the aristocracy and he created a technocracy where people with technical knowledge are the leaders. And the standardized test decided your place in society. And if you were a total worthless scum, you were an entrepreneur. <laughs> no wonder China had money trouble. So entrepreneurs were hated, despised, and, and were crushed by the people who passed the test. And so, uh, you know, uh, fathers will beat their boys for getting such a low score as like something hideously low like I don't want to say this terrible word, but someone getting as low as 97%. <laughs> I mean, that, that boy was going to cry his way home knowing he's going to get beaten by his father. This is Taiwan's culture. And a lot of the time, it might not be 97. I remember there was a girl in the first, well, second cram school I taught at. Very interesting story there. First boss tried to take my passport. Government did nothing. I gave the government an audio recording of my first boss trying to take my passport and the government did nothing. So don't act, expect help from the government. Oh, no, no, no. The audio recording is uh, safely in my archives somewhere, along with, uh, what did Will Smith say, the, 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 the videotape showing uh, who was asking a JFK in the uh, porno flick from Hitler's bunker, right? <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't ever need to see the light of day. But... I was at, at my, the, the second cram school I was teaching at as an ESL teacher. And one of my students couldn't listen in focus in class because her mother was a teacher at the school and she had only gotten 98% on the test. And the mother and the daughter showed up at school crying and the girl could not focus in class. And, and the school manager's like, oh yeah, 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 she really did bad. And, and my co-teacher, the other, the Taiwanese teacher who would help, also, yeah, you know, I said, tell them to grow up and get a life or they're never going to be able to handle reality. Oh my goodness. The thought that someone would say such heresy, speak such heresy. Uh, well, needless to say that um, my, the, 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 the Taiwanese teacher that was working with me understood where I was coming from, but knew that it wasn't going to change. But that was about all the sympathy I got. Manager and I didn't discuss it much, but because her mother's a teacher, so she's supposed to get 100, you see. Because, you know, th th this is a culture that worships ancestors, that family is your God, which is kind of why they do the nepotism thing. That's another problem all to itself, like family, f f f filial worship, I think it's called. It's an old, old thing. It's not. Asia did not invent it. Ancestor worship. And so when you've got an ancestor worship culture, a boss will think he's God. I was at the local Christian equivalent of a Willow Creek. Oh, only it's probably more of an Olstein. Willow Creek would never tolerate this. I mean, I know I was there. I went to school in Chicago. I went to Willow Creek as often as I could. And 
Of course, I would ask the people questions sitting next to me. Why do you come here? What do you think about it? Why do you like it? And here I am at this Willow Creek equivalent here in Taiwan, in, in the local city, and uh, a small group leader explained to me, Jesse, don't tell him to keep his word. He's the boss of the company. A boss is the god of the company and no one advises him. A small group leader at a solid Christian church is telling me this in Taiwan. So here we have this culture and in this, the test is everything. Uh, pardon me. I guess I'm allergic to all this. <laughs> the test is everything. And without the test, throw your life away. Suicide rates high. And this births this cram school culture. There are cram schools that, that only uh, teach math. Many, you know, some will only teach uh, Chinese. They'll have another one. It's like a, a study hall type of a thing. They'll teach a variety of subjects. I'll have a teacher that teaches a variety of subjects. Uh, it's, it's like it's like a it's, it's like a study hall with an active tutor, you know, roaming about the room. Those are actually very effective. Typically, students will be at these until nine or ten o'clock at night. Even elementary school students, you know, uh, parents don't need to raise them. That's for the teacher's job. You know, that's a teacher for the teacher to do. And they wonder why the home uh, situation is difficult. Yet, you know, they'll have three generations under one roof. Grandma and grandpa will live in the house, big houses big houses, townhouses usually. And even out in the middle of the country, they'll build a townhouse, single townhouse. It's, 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 it's how they do things. And they, they all live together. Grandma and grandpa are there together, but the kids aren't home with family. They respect family, but the family doesn't raise the family. And so in this, in this culture, one of the types of cram schools is the ESL school. They don't call it that. They call it an English school. See, it's the English class. You know, speaking from Taiwan, if I say English class or an English teacher, that's comparable to Spanish class in America. And I'm, I wouldn't say anything else. I would say Spanish because it's its dominant, important language. And see, in America, you would speak Spanish in hopes of being able to communicate with the, well, what the Bush family and the Karl Roves of the world want to become the lower class. But that's from what they've said. But, it, you know, in America, it's, it, and, or, or it's a cultural fascination. You know, the Spanish, you know, Spanish culture, Hispanic culture. Latino, I love Latino culture. It's great. Sure, great. We should. Okay. But in Asia, learning English is about reaching the upper class. Because that's international. That's trade. That's reaching America where the money is. It, that, that's how they see it. So from this, we have these English schools and there's this English school culture, but they teach English in this test culture style. And so, so from this, we get ESL schools. That's where ESL schools fit into all this. They call them English schools, of course. Now, in Taiwan, they want to teach primarily American English. In, in other Parts of the world, they don't care so much. I think there's a push for American English because they think the American market's bigger. Um, now there are British teachers that, that show up in Taiwan. And as any of your friendly banter with British folk uh, have, you know, normally I'm presuming an American audience primarily. But if you're British, I love you. Um, I'll take your pounds or, you know, what. <laughs> but... The normal banter between British culture and American culture happens between the, the teachers in Taiwan. The problem is when the British come to Taiwan and they do that, spell it correctly, these Taiwan, they're, they're doing a disservice because the test that the Taiwanese will take requires them to spell it the American way. So they're actually injuring the students. And so the British bring their normal British... America's richer. I'm, I'm the older brother who didn't make money like the, the younger brother who dropped out and became a millionaire did. So I'm going to be angry and kind of throw eggs at him, but I do love him. They bring that, that British attitude with them and then it ends up injuring the, the 
people who have to learn English or else their dad is going to beat them or they're not going to become a god because they're going to get something low like, I'm sorry for using such terrible language, but 97% on a test. It's a horrible and imaginable things, which is, of course, most people who, of course, have a very low view of themselves and then they just sit at home and play video games because after all, life's worthless, right? You know, one of the things I've tried to do here is to tell people, learn Linux. You can learn Linux. Learn. You can learn at home. You don't need to go to school or cram school in order to learn. Well, try to fit all that into this shame culture where you've got this semi-de facto mental illness thing going on. That's why it continues. You, you wonder, why does this continue? You're in a shame culture. We're in a shame culture. It, it's mass madness and it needs therapy. And the solution, the solution is for more Americans. Now, there are many, many redeeming qualities in Asia. It's, they're, they're a very friendly, in a word, cuddly. I said that I was talking with a professor from Roosevelt University, I believe it was in Chicago. I was, I was waiting at the airport. And, I, and he had two Taiwanese students um, for master's, master's degree. And I said, aren't Taiwanese great? He said, yeah. I said, in a word, cuddly. And he said, yeah, yeah, very friendly. They don't invade your personal space, but they really don't have harsh boundaries for their own personal space. Um, and very, very friendly and, and relaxed and very forgiving. And you could insult them and they'll just change the subject and you'll never hear about it again. They won't hold a grudge. It's really an amazing culture. And if you're trying to deal with anger issues, Taiwan's the perfect place to help get over them uh, if you want to get over them. <laughs> but if you don't, life's going to be hard because there are a lot of challenges and these things, these problems exist in culture. But Taiwan needs help dealing with the shame culture and dealing with this academic culture, which is all part of it. More coming next time.